So just want to let you guys know, today we're going to be talking about the topic of civil disobedience. And when John and I were thinking about this series in, back in the fall, we had no clue that things were going to happen on college campuses like they had this spring. But the reason I really wanted to talk about this as we were thinking about politics is because we have a wonderful pastoral letter that our denomination has created on the topic of civil disobedience. Now, you may be asking, what exactly is a pastoral letter? Well, in the EPC, we have several documents that are part of our kind of like constitution, our makeup. Uh, we have the Westminster Confession of Faith, that defines our doctrine. We have the Book of Order, that kind of defines our system of government and all of the little disciplines here and there and, and some other things, um, church membership, all of those things. And then we have these two things called uh, p position papers and pastoral letters. And position papers are papers that are written by our denomination to show to the outside world what do we believe about certain uh, positions, certain things uh, that are out there. Uh, we have position papers uh, on abortion or women's ordination or the value of human lives and many and several others. And if you want to, you can go to the EPC's website and you can go to that and they have it there. It's published. Anybody has access to it. Pastoral letters are written specifically for inside the denomination. Doesn't mean that people from outside can't access it, but it's not on the web. If you wanted to get a pastoral letter, you would have to write and they would email it to you. You could also talk to John or I if you really wanted to have a pastoral letter. We do have them. But they are really letters generated for inside the, our denomination for guidance. And so we have pastoral letters on things like domestic abuse and organ transplants. Uh, we're in the current froze, we should uh, hopefully in the next year have one on racial lament is gonna be one that's gonna be talked about this summer at GA. And then of course, our lesson today on civil disobedience. Now as Christians, we can acknowledge the secular world we live in is deeply flawed, and yet it's a place that we have been called to live in and try to do everything in our power to make it prosperous for all people. So how do we address the tension in between that of the secular world and us trying to do good things in it? And when is it appropriate for there to be civil disobedience from the Christian perspective? Because there are generally three positions on the matter of civil disobedience. There's the anarchist view that says a person can choose to disobey the government whenever they like and per feel perfectly fine and justified in doing so. There's absolutely no biblical support for that point of view. The other is the extremist patriot who says a person should always follow and obey his country and their laws no matter what the commands. This was actually the defense at the trial in Nuremberg for the people, the Nazis, who were being tried at the end of World War II. But scripture holds a, an act of biblical submission with a Christian being allowed to act in in civil disobedience to governments if it commands evil, such that it requires a Christian to act in a manner contrary to what Scripture says and its clear teachings in God's Word. Now, I, I want you to know up front as I'm going through this, I am going to be quoting heavily and extensively from that pastoral letter. Uh, I tell you that up front so that you, A, don't accuse me of plagiarism, uh, but two, uh, I'm not going to like every time say, well, the pastoral letter says this. We're just going to move through. But it is so beautifully written, I could not improve upon it. So with that, let's read our scripture this morning. Uh, Daniel 3, just real quick summary of where we are in Daniel 3. Uh, this is then the exile. The people of Jerusalem have been conquered by Babylon. Uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, has taken a group of them over to, to the king, uh, to the uh, uh, capital of Babylon, Babylonia. And, no, I got that wrong. Anyway, whatever it is, uh, sorry. Uh, they're going to, the country is Babylonia. Sorry. Uh, but, uh, so they're over there, and Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are there. And in chapter 3, the king has built a statue that he is requiring everybody to worship at. And that's where this picks up. And of course, there are some who are not happy with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, because the king kind of likes them, and so there's some jealousy going on. And that's where we pick up in verse 12. 
these guys come to king, the king and they say, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. Then king Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered them and said, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a fiery furnace. And who is this God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression on, of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's go to him in a brief word of prayer, and we'll dig in. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we do ask for your grace and mercy to be upon us today as we look at uh, an, an interesting concept in Scripture. Uh, how do we do civil disobedience and be scriptural about it? So, Father, open all of our hearts and minds to think through it. Father, be with the one who speaks. He is a great sinner, but he has a great Savior. Now, Father, may the, words of my may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. On July 29th, 1994, Paul Jennings Hill, a Reformed Theological Seminary graduate and a former pastor ordained in our sister denominations, the PCA and the OPC, approached the Ladies Center, an abortion clinic in Pensacola, Florida. And there he waited until he saw the clinic's doctor, uh, John Britton, and his bodyguard, retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel James H. Barrett, come outside the clinic. And as those two men were walking to the, their car, unexpectedly, he, Paul Hill fired upon them at close range with a Mossberg Model 500A 12-gauge pump-action shotgun. Both Britton and Barrett died, and Barrett's wife, June, was wounded. Following the shots, Hill laid his shotgun on the ground and waited to be arrested. At his trial, acting as his own lawyer, Hill attempted to use an affirmative defense, claiming his actions were a defensive act on behalf of the unborn and not him seeking retribution. The jury saw through that, found him guilty of murder, and sentenced him to die by lethal injection, which took place on September 3rd, 2003. Now, prior to the murders, uh, Hill had sent up two position papers that he had written himself to author Gary North. Now, Gary North, you need to understand, is in the Reformed umbrella, but there is a big, lots of places within the umbrella of Reformed theology. He is in what's called the Reconstructionist uh, part of that umbrella. Uh, it's also got a term named theonomy. If you've heard that, great. If not, don't worry about it. Here's basically what it means. There is a segment within Reformed theology that wants the United States to go back to like a theocracy and have all of the Old Testament laws apply again. That's what Reconstruction is. So Paul Hill has written Gary North thinking, this guy's on my side. And so he writes to him on his views of abortion and why he considered the mur murder of abortion care providers to be warranted and an act of civil disobedience. Gary North responded with two public letters that he made, and the letters rejected and refuted Hill's theological arguments and concluded that the public will regard your dual assassination as the act of a condemned man outside of God's church and acting on his own defiance of Bible revealed law and therefore also God's moral law. 
the people of God, redeemed by His grace, have always lived their lives in a state of dynamic tension with the world. And by the world, I mean the sum total of every thought, word, and attitude and action contrary to God's revealed world. In this secular society we live in, whose values are so indifferent to and contrary to God's word, we need to earnestly endeavor to follow the paths of righteousness for the sake of the Lord's name. But how do we do that? How do we live in this tension? Well, we see it in Romans 13 and Acts 5, which we'll read in just a second. But I, I do think it's interesting. Uh, critics of the Bible often speak about their objections to it, be, saying things like, oh, there's so many different contradictions in Scripture. Uh, you know, Proverbs 26 is probably the best version of this. In verses 4 and 5, you get these two sentences back to back. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his eyes. Which is it? <laughs> Seems to indicate the Bible is speaking out of both sides of its mouth to the folks who are critics of Scripture. The theologically, how can we both have predestination and free will at the exact same time? The truth of the matter is this, that Scripture is quite content to allow us to live in the tension of two seemingly opposite things. We see it in the New Testament in Romans 13 and Acts 5, because they, on the surface they seem to be promoting two opposite ideas. Romans 13 says this, this is Paul writing to the Romans, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore... Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer." Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And now contrast that to Acts chapter 5. And what's happening in Acts chapter 5 is Peter and the apostles are preaching and they've been told, don't preach the, the, the gospel. And they've gone out still and preached the gospel and then they have this interaction. And when they had brought them, uh, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. Men, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Throughout the New Testament, there is this tension between the calling of God's people to be faithful to the Lord and the authority of the civil government. During the life of Christ, the supreme civil authority was Rome. The people in Judea that Christ was ministering in were also under a subordinate th authority, the puppet kings of the Herodian family. Religious authority under the chief priests is also closely related to the Jewish civil authority there. <laughs> Following the time of Pentecost, when the gospel message begins to go out, it's still under the supreme authority of Rome and, the, and subordinate authorities that are there in the various areas. And we, were, we observe remarkable consistency, both in teaching and in practice, the principle of supreme loyalty and obedience to God, with a sincere effort to be respectful, law-abiding citizens, obedient to civil authority, to the limit of conscience. But as we see in Acts 5, there did come a time 
where those two things clashed to the point where a decision had to be made as to which was going to be followed and is civil disobedience going to be the course that we go. Christ te taught on this and his teaching and his ministry both affirmed and conflicted with the authorities. He straightforwardly teaches complete obedience to the law of God from the heart which is above every civil law in Matthew 5. And yet he acknowledges an individual's responsibility to the authority of Caesar in Matthew 22. He pays the temple tax in Matthew 17. And yet as the rightful Lord of the temple, he drives out the corrupt money changers in John chapter 2. He counsels his disciples not to use violence as his arrest and submits to the Jewish authorities, even though he says, I have the abundant power to overcome them. And in humble majesty, he stands before Pilate, declaring the distinct nature of his spiritual kingdom and the supremacy of God's authority over that Roman kingdom. And so we need to ask ourselves, when is civil disobedience warranted? There are times when Christians may feel compelled to take a public stand against the ways of the world. And often this can be done without breaking the civil law. For instance, a merchant can choose not to be open on Sunday. A physician can refuse to perform an abortion. People can conduct orderly demonstrations for a cause. Please notice I said orderly. Most of our protestations recently have been anything but. And let me just say this, stepping outside for one second, and just so I can make everybody on the political spectrum mad, if you are mad at January 6th, you need to be mad at the way the college protests went down, and vice versa. We can hold even just the evangelistic, and I'll get it right, meeting in public places if we secure a permit that is required. Those are all things we can do without breaking the civil law. But there are times when the laws of the land permit or command behavior that is clearly contrary to the will of God in Scripture. Injustice, harm to people, and oppression are of such an evil and oppressing and degrading nature that Christians need to be united together to question and potentially break civil law that in order to bring justice and preserve human life. There are times, it hasn't happened here in the United States, but there are, have been in other places where there have been laws that are directly contrary to God's word and must be disobeyed. In Soviet Russia, uh, the, the giving out of Bibles was, was illegal. You could not do it, and for years, Christians smuggled Bibles into Soviet Russia. Some nations have laws against active evangel evangelization. Uh, Y'all have heard me talk numerous times about the guy that I so love and cherish as a mentor, Joe Novenson. He tells this great story of how he went to India and he was ministering there and he was preaching and everything else and the authorities came up to him and said, you have to stop preaching. And Joe looked at his Indian host, Chanda, and he says, do we need to stop? And Chanda looked back at him and he says, my Bible instructs me what to do when I'm told not to preach his word. Does yours? And Joe turned to Chanda and he says, take care of my son who was with him on the trip and continued preaching. The Bible gives us numerous examples of civil disobedience in which God's people sought to do what is right in obedience to God in spite of violating civil law or decree. We see it with the Hebrew midwives in Exodus chapter 1. They've been told, kill all of the male babies. And they go to the Pharaoh and say a half-truth at best, which is, hey, those Hebrew women, they're just so different than you Egyptian women. Uh, they just have the babies before we can even get there. Or how about Rahab when she hides the Israelite spies? She refuses to surrender them to the messenger and in fact says, oh, no, no, they went, they went this way, leading them the exact opposite way from where they were going to be. 
I don't know if this has happened to y'all, but sometimes people try to trip me up as a Christian with asking the ethical question, hey, is it ever okay to lie? What about in in Nazi Germany? There are times when in faithfulness to God's kingdom, it means subverting corrupt authorities. If you want to use that answer, if that ever happens to you, if that question gets posed, please feel free. We see it again, uh, people, uh, David, when he fled Saul. Saul is the rightful authority he should have been submitting, but of course David knows, A, I'm the anointed, (laughs) B, Saul is not acting right. How about Daniel's companions? We've already looked at that one story, and we'll talk about it in a second, coming back to Daniel 3, but how about in Daniel chapter 1, when the king gives this edict, they all have to eat from my table, and they go to to an underling of the king and say, look, We have some dietary laws. Let us at least try this for like a week. Let us eat our dietary laws and let's see how it compare and everything else. And so the guy does it, even though he's a little afraid of the king. But Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand up and say, we can't eat like you've asked us to. Or how about in our passage today, Daniel 3, they refuse to bow and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold and if you remember the end of the story after they are thrown into the fiery furnace there is a theophany an appearance of god in that fiery furnace with them to the point where they look and they're like there's four people in there we only threw in three and then the king calls them out and shadrach meshach and abednego come out they are completely unhurt just their ropes have been burned off And then, of course, Daniel, later in, the, in chapter 6, he refuses to obey the decree that, that he only prayed to the king for 30 days. Uh, and, of course, is thrown into the lion's den. And miraculously, again, God steps in and keeps Daniel safe. In these cases, in the, in, in the book of Daniel, one thing we see is they were willing to accept the consequences. And God miraculously saved them. But if God had so chosen for them to die at that moment, they were willing to do that in obedience to God and to the civil authority. Last one we read just a little bit ago, the story of Matt Mordecai as he refuses to kneel and pay honor to Haman, disobeying the command of King Xerxes II. And so that leads us to the question of what are the principles for Christian living within the realm of civil disobedience? First and foremost, our supreme loyalty and devotion is to God. We must never compromise loyal obedience to the revealed word of God. Uh, Martin Luther, when he is called to recant uh, as he's posted his 95 Theses and the church is mad at him because of what he said, they say, you must recant. And he responds to them at the Diet of Worms. Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against, any, uh, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. And then we need to remember that our weapons, they are spiritual and not physical. We stand for the right and and we oppose the wrong by prayer and persuasion, preaching, witnessing, teaching, and doing acts of compassion and mercy rather than violence in either word or deed. 2 Timothy 2 says the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of truth. I am completely against abortion. I stopped attending pro-life rallies outside of abortion clinics because of the behavior of the other people outside of those clinics who instead of saying, we're praying for you, we, we beg you, please don't do this, but we're praying for you, would call the young ladies murderers. And that's the word I can repeat in here. We have to be different. We have to not quarrel. We need to be doing things that leads people to repentance and yelling and screaming and name-calling isn't it. 
because we are called to exemplary citizenship. We are not only to be obedient and submissive to authority, but we must aim to do what is right and good, showing respect for the authority and pray for those in authority in order that Christians may live peaceful and quiet lives in goodliness and holiness. And we need to pray specifically for our leaders that they would change their hearts if they are leading in an ungodly manner. Back to Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not get snarky, did not name, call, or disrespect the king, but instead continuing to refer to him as king. I'm often shocked and repulsed when I hear or see Christians use coarse language or name calling to defame those that they oppose. You may have seen this bumper sticker uh, on the back of a car. Uh, it looks okay, right? Pray for Trump or pray for Biden. Psalm 109.8. Oh, yes, let's pray. Everything. This looks good until you realize what Psalm 109.8 says. And it says, may his days be few. May another take his office. That is offensive because that is taking God's word and using God's word, which is sacred, in order to demean somebody else. What about when civil laws are bad? Christians should work nonviolently within the laws of the land to change a government that has laws or commands that are in direct violation of God's laws and commands. We are absolutely permitted to work within the legal system, whatever it happens to be, to try to change laws, to try to get elected law people in that have godly values. We should be doing that. And when it is impossible to change laws, then Christians are permitted to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And in response to the unjust laws of Jim Crow in the early 1960s, people participated in civil disobedience by having sit-ins at lunch counters, weighed-ins at pools, and other challenges to various ordinances that promoted segregation. In World War II, Corey Ten Bloom, Boom and her family were arrested and put into concentration camps because they were willing to house and hide Jewish people. And if we disobey an evil government, unless we can flee from that government, we need to be willing to accept that government's punishment for our actions. Martin Luther King was arrested several times. Again, Corey Ten Bloom and her family are going, went to a concentration camp and several of them died. We should do everything in our power participating in the democratic process. But we need to understand that passing laws, that can do some good, but it doesn't change the heart. We still need to present the gospel message to people all around us. We can never operate under the principle that the end justifies the means. We must remember the warning that Paul gives to those who say, let us do evil that good may result, their condemnation is deserved. Or how about Christ warning us uh, to, in, in the time of responding to violence so that he does to Peter as he's trying to be arrested, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. For us as Christians, hostile behavior is contrary to Christ's calling in our lives to love and pray and do good for our enemies. And that's where Paul Hill failed. As we conclude our reflection on Christian civil disobedience, let us remember the profound example set by Christ and his apostles. Christian civil disobedience is not about rebellion for rebellion's sake, but about a deeper allegiance to God's kingdom and his justice. It calls us to a higher standard of love and justice and mercy, transcending human laws when they conflict with the divine commandments. Acts 5.29, Peter and the apostles declare, we must obey God rather than human beings. 
This principle guides our actions, ensuring our disobedience is never rooted in selfishness or mere defiance, but in commitment to God's truth and his well-being for all of creation. Our actions must reflect the, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so as we go forth, let us seek God's guidance in all of our actions. Let us be peacemakers who, when ch necessary, challenge injustice with grace and truth. May our lives be a testimony to the love of Christ, showing the world a different path, one of compassion and justice and transformative love. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., the art of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Let us be co-laborers with Christ in bending that ark, even when it requires us to stand against the powers of the world. May God grant us the wisdom to discern his will, the courage to act justly, and the love to transform our communities. Amen and amen.